Hello everyone and welcome to Autosport's Hungarian Grand Prix driver rankings. Alex and I are here to rate the performance of each driver. But as always, if you don't agree at home with the rankings that we are giving, head on over to autosport.com where you can give your own opinions uh, and basically reassess what we've been talking about. So let's dive straight in. We're going to go through team by team, starting with Williams, Alex. Now again, um, really strong qualifying from Williams. I mean, it, it, it's, it almost makes me a little bit sad that we are celebrating the fact that both of the drivers got into Q2 um, because that's not usually something to be celebrated. But in the case of Williams, it was the first time since the Italian Grand Prix in 2018. And it was almost like a victory for them, really, wasn't it? Yeah, qualifying really is the uh, the highlight these days for Williams. It seems almost to be the opposite of last year, the team fields, where they're starring against the clock and then fading back to sort of their sort of natural position in the pecking order in the race. Latifi gets a six because of his spin. He had a big costly spin when he put two wheels on the grass. And yeah, he was carrying a bit of damage for his clash with science, but that was, you know, that was that was a pretty big error there. Russell sort of just did what you expect, really. I felt like it was a bit like Austria the week before, an absolutely phenomenal performance in qualifying and then only really one big error in the race or or significant error let's put it that way which was the start I thought it was pretty good from there to be honest um yeah and Latifi I think actually maybe you could you could argue that I was a bit harsh on him there with a six but that spin was was pretty was pretty damning right okay Alfa Romeo let's move on okay so Kimi Raikkonen's got a six Giovinazzi's got a seven why have you rated Giovinazzi higher than Raikkonen? Of course, the reason why Giovinazzi is ahead is because Raikkonen's error was just that unforgivable. Otherwise, he would himself have got a seven. Um, it was a pretty good performance for, for Giovinazzi. He was about where you'd expect the car to be, which is at the back, unfortunately, for Alfa Romeo. He outqualifies Raikkonen. And it was, he ends up on, a, on, on the worst strategy because Alfa Romeo put him on the softs at the start when they switch off the inters. Therefore, he was always going to have an extra stop because that tyre, as we saw with Charles Leclerc, which is not the one to be on. So I thought it was a, a, a decent performance. And by the letter of our rules, uh, yeah, he earns a seven. Okay, moving on to uh, the Alpha Tauris. Uh, mixed bag for that team. Obviously, Gasly had uh, some mechanical issues that blew up pretty dramatically during the race and, and meaning that he didn't actually finish. But so you've given him an eight. Um, but what, so what was that? First off, what was that problem? So the team says it's a gearbox problem. It looked pretty smoky for a gearbox problem, but that is their official explanation. Okay, and Daniel Kvyat, we've given a seven. Now, he was one of the first drivers that, on the um, television coverage that we heard, started uh, the whole, maybe it's time for slicks before we even get going. Um, but they didn't come in for slicks in the end. Um, but again, um, not as strong a performance in qualifying as Gasly. Seven seems about kind of middle of the road. Not much more he could have done, really. Yeah, this was a, a decent performance from Kvyat. Yeah, it's interesting at the start, as you say, Jess, he, he, did, he was asking to come in and change for slicks and Alpha Tauri ignores him because they were aware of the rules. They were like, we're not allowed to come in and change, uh, change your tyres, which Haas, of course, did, as we'll get to later, and ended up getting penalised. I think the fact that Haas kept their point has, uh, has annoyed Alpha Tauri somewhat. But yeah, Kvyat, yeah. The reason why he's below Gasly is because the, he was knocked out in Q1. Um, you know, that, that car is probably good enough to get into Q2. And Gasly put it into Q3, which is why he's rewarded with such a high score, because that was terrific. Remember, he lost all of FP1 with, with an engine problem. Uh, then it rained in FP2. Um, he obviously back out in FP3. And then the car broke again in qualifying. He was moaning about it in all three stages. Didn't get to set a lap in Q3. So, yeah, for his fine performance against what seemed to be a very fragile car... I think Gasly deserves an eight. Obviously, you know, we don't know what he would have gone on to score in the race because he's not well at 15. But yeah, very well done by Gasly in qualifying. Absolutely. And you mentioned the Haases. They're who we're going to move on to next. And uh, I mean, I, maybe I understand where this is coming from, but you've given Magnussen a 10 out of 10, which is obviously a perfect score uh, based on our rankings. And if you want to know how the rankings work, um, we're going to link that in the description below so you can understand our rationale. But a 10 out of 10, I mean, he was definitely, I mean, he, had, he did it. He had a phenomenal drive. They, they made the call to move to slicks, which as you've said, they got penalised for because... And, and the, the ins and outs of that is because the engineers aren't allowed to give any information other than safety on the formation lap, right? They can't give instructions to the driver. They can't tell the driver to come in. But that's what ultimately happened with Haas. And so both drivers got 10 second penalties, which dropped them down the, the, the rankings. But both of the Well, Magnussen had a strong drive. Grosjean, you've given an eight. So, yeah, I'm like, you rated these guys really, really highly. 
I'm not sure I give Grosjean as high as an eight, and I definitely don't think I could give Magnussen a 10 out of 10 performance, probably a nine. And Grosjean, I don't know, like maybe a six. I just what? this is oh a six. This is so harsh on Haas. Yes, I can't <laughs> believe that. Kevin Magnussen. I'm sorry. That car. That car is Q1 material. It's it should be nowhere near the points in a race where there's only one finisher. Now, yes, of course, they did benefit from what was ultimately an illegal call. But that's not the driver's fault. They can only really do what's put in front of them. If they come in, I mean, it was baffling to see Magnussen on the extreme wet tires at the start. Anyway, but anyway, they come in and they he aces the race. He stays in front of some much faster cars. I'm thinking Lance Stroll's racing point for a long time. Like I was. Ultimately, that sort of harms uh, Stroll's score when we get to him because I just thought it was terrific from Magnussen, and and you know he didn't he didn't do what he probably felt the urge to do, which was to fight everyone very hard. He knew exactly that there was no point racing much much quicker cars when they were coming uh, back at you. And he ends up P9 in the road, holds on to get a point in a in a car that, that does not deserve it at the moment based on pure pace. And and Grosjean, yeah, okay, maybe maybe that's a bit generous, but he actually picks up damage when Alex Albon comes past him. And actually I think Grosjean deserves credit for not them to not having a massive accident. If you look at the onboards, he actually he actually turns out of the corner when he realizes Albon's down the inside and a big chunk of his front wing comes off. So yeah, that's that's why he stood down particularly badly in the second half of the race. But I don't think you can blame him too too harsh for that. And the reason why he's two points behind Magnussen in, in, in what I've given him is just because, yeah, before that damage, he was already sliding back faster than Magnussen. He was just sort of accelerated by the contact with the Red Bull. Um, moving on to Renault. Again, it was a really just kind of meh performance from Ocon and actually quite a strong drive from Ricardo. So you've given Ricardo an eight. Okay. Maybe, yeah, mm, I mean, why, okay, why have you given Ricardo an eight? I'm going to let you explain your point before I jump in. Well, actually, I think, I thought he was a contender for a nine because I thought he put in a very fine performance. You know, he ran long in that first stint on the, on the drives after switching from the, from the inters. Um, but the reason why he, he does end up with an eight is because Gasly gets ahead in qualifying and the Renault is a faster car. So you think that Ricardo didn't really maximize everything at the key performance per our, um, sorry, at the key, at uh, the key moments per our, criteria um, but yeah a good a good run I mean you could also say maybe maybe he should have had more of an attack on Perez later on when he had a sort of soft tire softer tire advantage but I think that would be that would be splitting hairs considering how good that racing point is so yeah I was, I was very impressed by it by Ricardo Ocon on the other hand I really wasn't I mean he sort of seemed to imply in his quotes after the race that the team had had sort of messed things up by double stacking when they came in the inters but if you watch the onboard he's not held up at all he goes straight into his grid box Ricardo's clearly gone and they service him immediately so you know if any time lost was minimal uh, and he had a bad start again yeah maybe there is something to, to the suggestion that the right hand side of the grid there was a problem except for the fact that there was a Ferrari on the right hand side of the grid and both Ferraris launched phenomenally uh, so yeah interesting one there for Ocon bad start bad race 5 out of 10 moving on to McLaren bit more of a disappointing race for both guys um, this uh, last weekend you know they've been they've been so strong i saw a lot of people asking what the hell happened to scenario seven because after i mean so norris got a pretty bad start and as we know in hungary it's really difficult to overtake i think the television coverage kept uh, reminding us that hungary is monaco without the boats which which is wrong it's monaco without the walls what the earth that was about anyway yeah <laughs> That is also true. <laughs> yeah, so it's got no walls and it's got no boats. So basically it's nothing like Monaco, only that you can't overtake around it very easily. So uh, Carlos Sainz, you've given an eight and Lando Norris, you've given a six. Is Norris's six predominantly down to his start? It is, yeah. That's what he says he called my first proper big mistake of the season, which I think is fair enough when you consider his drives in Austria. Although I still maintain that overtake, or, you know, uh, passing cars under yellow flags was his first big mistake of the season there, Lando. But anyway, I digress. Um, yeah, that, that, that made it was a pretty difficult drive uh, for Norris from there. But he, he still should have beaten Kvyat in the, in the Alpha Tauri because that is, that is a slower car. Um, I did think this was a weekend, you know, uh, it looks on the face of it like an underwhelming weekend for McLaren. But I think this is just actually where they are in the pecking order. I think the Hungaroring sort of exposed where all the cars are really except for Red Bull which was kind of all over the place because of their handling problems um, yeah science hard to fault really because he wasn't at fault for what happened to him in the race like Vettel he got held up very very badly when everybody came in to change inters and they couldn't release him into the path of another car because as he himself found out at the end of the pit lane when Williams did it with Latifi to him there is uh, there is the, the chance of an absolute 
terrible accident. And actually, uh, Sainz was was fortunate not to. He actually, I think he clips the pit lane exit board, the marker board. It's so it's, it's a, you know it's incredible that there wasn't a bigger crash there. And um, I thought he did quite well from there. As you say, with the difficulties in overtaking, uh, he showed very well against the clerk. Okay, maybe he had a bit of a tire advantage, but um, but yeah, I, I thought this was uh, another 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 strong performance from Sainz that we'd we'd come to expect really. A team that had a much better weekend was Ferrari. Well, for at least one of the drivers, was Ferrari. Um, Sebastian Vettel kind of did pretty much everything he could do in that in that Ferrari and brought the car home um, where he thought was pretty much as far up the at the pecking order as, as he possibly could. He as you mentioned, he was really unlucky in that pit stop. I did think there was a if you look watch the replay and it's obviously very easy to say in hindsight when you are not uh, in the thick of it. But there was a gap, wasn't there, where they could have released his his car, but they chose not to. Again highlighting because the risk is what happened to science and latifi uh, but that did kind of delay him by quite a lot um he seemed to have a better tire strategy than leclerc leclerc did not get on with those those softs but you've given vettel an eight and leclerc a seven why why leclerc behind vettel is it purely just on where he ended up it's more down to, to qualifying in the in that Leclerc was the slower of the two Ferrari drivers this weekend. Yeah, he was he was he was very much disadvantaged by going onto the softs, which was uh, Mattia Bonotto admitted afterwards Ferrari gambling on more rain, or they expected more rain to arrive, so they didn't think he'd be on it for very long. Unfortunately, that didn't come to them. Um, but then, yeah, Leclerc just a bit all over the place all weekend, which he sort of which he, which he admitted to. You know, he did, I thought he did well considering he put th- fifty laps on his third stint. You know, that's pretty that's pretty impressive. Um, but yeah, just 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 that shade behind. Vettel who actually I thought was a candidate for a 9 out of 10 considering how troublesome that Ferrari is he qualified it exactly where he needed to he beat a Red Bull okay that says more about the oh he beat both Red Bulls didn't he it says more about the Red Bull struggles than the car but still you know very well done but he sort of he slid he slid wide at turn two and gifted Albon a pass and really when you're a four times world champion I don't think you should be making that kind of mistake but still nevertheless very very good weekend for Vettel. Yeah and I did I just want to talk about Leclerc's defending because even though he was on that soft attire and was struggling and he was be- he was begging his engineers to bring him in because he didn't think this rain was going to come and he needed to change those tires pretty quick um he did put up some good battles I thought even though he was he was down on pace not not very confident with the car he's his race craft is is really strong and it, it's just good to see that he wasn't giving up so yeah Maybe that's, that is also a saving grace for Leclerc. Now, moving on to Racing Point, again, a tale of two very different stories for the drivers. Um, can we finally put the Lance Stroll is nothing more than a pay driver uh, opinions to bed after this weekend? Oh yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, well, it's, it's kind of like it's kind of difficult to argue against that when your dad owns the team. But don't forget, he is a, he is an F one podium finisher. He's a Formula Three champion. Yeah, okay, you know, race for the best team in F three and things like that. Um, but this is a, this is a really good performance from Stroll. Again, he was he was he was one who who might have been a candidate for a nine out of ten, but. There was that you know he he didn't get past Kevin Magnussen in the early stages as quickly as he should have done considering how quick we know that racing point is now, and he finished nearly a minute behind Lewis Hamilton, um, which actually should have been well over a minute when you consider Lewis Hamilton's stop. Now that Mercedes is just so good even compared to effectively the uh, the design from last year which Racing Point is running that you know we can't we can't we can't have a go at Stroll too much. Um, but yeah, I thought I thought fourth was fourth was fourth was pretty good. Disappointed that he'd probably be disappointed not to get a podium, but when Verstappen's performing on another level, as we saw, that's what it's going to be. And can I move on to Sergio Perez now because I'd like to heavily criticise him? <laughs> yeah, you've given him a five, which is savage. Um, he wasn't feeling very well. He said he was feeling quite dizzy in qualifying, which is why uh, he ended up where he where he ended up. Um, but. Yeah, it just wasn't. It just was not his weekend at all. Especially when all these rumours are flying around about Vettel taking his seat. He kind of almost couldn't afford to have a bad weekend. But right, lay into him, Alex. What have you? What, what's your beef? Five out of ten. Five out of ten. Because yeah, okay, yeah. He said he felt unwell in qualifying. Um, we have to take him at his word. Um, but it was still an unexpected defeat to Stroll. I would say. I would say I would put Perez quicker than Stroll over a lap. He also had a very bad start. Oh, uh, and just incidentally, he said that the you know the, the issues with being dizzy didn't reoccur in the race. Um, had a very bad start behind Valtteri Bottas, uh, and then he makes another big error, which nearly puts him in the wall just after he takes slicks as he's coming through. You know the twisty twisty bits in the second sector, turn ten, puts a wheel on the grass 
and he's very lucky that he's able to gather it up. Uh, and ultimately, he never made it back past Vettel, which we know is a slower car. I mean, it sounds silly still saying the racing point is a much faster car than the Ferrari, but it is. And yeah, just didn't, didn't get it back to where he should have been, didn't qualify it probably where he should have been. And yeah, this was, this was a, 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 a not needed bad weekend for Perez. Mm. I think, I think, yeah, I think I, I'm probably going to have to agree. Uh, reminder, if you don't agree, head on over to autosport.com and let us know what you think or let us know in the comments, which no, undoubtedly we are being inundated with comments as we, as we speak. But let's move on to the Red Bulls, which strange weekend for Red Bull. Looked like they still had a lot of balance issues. Um, they had a lot, that, I mean, their mechanics, they just did a sterling job. So shout out to the Red Bull mechanics for, uh, for, for everything that they did this weekend. Verstappen's got another nine. Very consistent in your scoring. Uh, he's, he's got nines every Grand Prix so far. Uh, but can we forgive a mistake like driving onto your grid place and absolutely pretty much, I mean, he almost didn't start. He was 25 seconds away from not being able to start this Grand Prix. He was indeed. I mean, this was a brilliant race drive. Absolutely 10 out of 10 from the moment the lights went out to the flag, Verstappen was incredible. But he cannot have a perfect score because he crashed on the way to the grid. That's that's just not that's just not what should be happening at all. Um, there is a case to be made that he should have made he should have lost more points in our rankings uh, because of that error because it was so costly. But ultimately, it wasn't as costly as it could have been. And he beats a Mercedes, and that Mercedes is so good. You have to you have to really reward him there. Uh, yeah, consistent with Verstappen in 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 the, in the driver rankings. You have to go back to the Austria one where he where he did well despite not finishing. Um, but yeah, yeah, I just I just thought he was absolutely tremendous. But there's no way he was going to get a perfect score once he crashed. A mistake like that is just seems so rookie and not like uh, like something that Verstappen should be should be doing. But um, Alex Albon. He's had a lot of bad press. Um, he's not had a great start to the season, but this was this was kind of a makeup drive, really. Um, managing to work his way back up to fifth um, after qualifying so far so far back and being knocked out in Q2. Um, it was it was a really good recovery drive on a track that's not easy to 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 pass cars. So a six is that a bit harsh or like what why why a six? You, you could you could definitely make the case that this is a bit harsh here, but whatever the problem with the RB16 is, and the team are finally admitting that there is some sort of aero anomaly at play because we've seen it spinning in testing, it was spinning in Austria, and again it was spinning like Verstappen spun it in, in, in FP3. So there's clearly, clearly something going on with the car that they're, that they're going to have to look into. Um, but it just shouldn't be getting knocked out in Q2. It's, there's There's no excuse for what is still, I think, the second fastest car when everything works going out in Q2. Like, I know, I know he's struggling. I know things are difficult for him. But a Red Bull out in Q2 is bad. But, but he came on the radio and said, what did you expect me to, to do? You put me out in traffic. So is that not a team problem? I mean, I think he seemed to think that he could have done a lot better than, than Q2, um, but couldn't because he was, he was in traffic. So is that fair on Alex? Is that, because that's not Alex's call, right? No, but you know, the car's so good. I, th I think I think you should have got into Q2. The, you know, everybody seems to be having traffic. It wasn't like Q3 where you know, it's down to those ten runners. It was always gonna it was always gonna become a potential issue. And and don't forget, you know, he could have gone quicker. At another point in in Q2, it wasn't didn't just come down to one run for him. So uh, so yeah, a, a disappointing qualifying, very disappointing qualifying, um, and a good race, a good race though. Um, I think I still think I still think he's very lucky that Grosjean didn't wipe them both out. And and if and if Grosjean had, it would have been Albon's fault because the, that move was so late. So yeah, that's that's why that, that you know hitting another car. It's a non-contact sport. That's why he doesn't get a seven. Let's move on to a team that just absolutely smashed it out of the bag as we were expecting because of their dominance this year. But Mercedes. Lewis Hamilton, 10 out of 10 drive. He didn't really put a foot wrong the entire weekend. Uh, yeah, I, you've put this down in, in your notes, Alex, but I, I think this is incredible as well. I mean, it's kind of sad for everyone watching at home, but he lapped everybody up to fifth. 10 out of 10 drive, right? Yeah, I mean, there's really not very much to say about Lewis Hamilton. He was so good. I mean, I had, um, I, I think I had my word count was 2,600 words for Autosport magazine, the report this week. And if I if I opted to lead it on Lewis Hamilton, I would have come nowhere near close to filling it because it was just simply, simply superb. Um, 
yet great in qualifying, you know, edged Bottas at a track where he excels. The car is so good. Go and watch the onboards from those qualifying laps. He's, they're just, they're just tremendous. Um, and yeah, brilliant. Again, just, just showed his class in the wet. Three seconds to the good at the end of lap one. It, it's just 10 out of 10. There's no way you can argue with that. Now, his teammate didn't have the race he was maybe expecting. And a lot of that came down to his... Um jump start um it's not being called a jump start by the fia because the sensor wasn't triggered and that's how they are judging jump starts um um it, it dropped him all the way down i think you said uh, he got down to sixth by the end of lap one which um i mean he's lucky he's got a decent car under him that made that he could make those places up but he he did look at one point like he was going to have max but then pitted and just couldn't get there quite in in the in the end and came in p3 which um as you've pointed out alex for a shortened a shorter championship than we than we usually have he kind of needs to have all his ducks in a row to be able to take it to hamilton who's now five points clear as we go into uh the first of the british grand prix seven out of ten you've given him I have, yeah. I mean, Jesse, it's like if you think back to Lewis Hamilton's sort of scruffy race at the start of the uh, of the campaign, all those weeks ago in Austria, wasn't long at all, of course, was it? Um, but yeah, Lewis Hamilton, it seems, can make mistakes and recover from them because that's just the level of his talent. Valtteri Bottas, while he is a very, very, very good Formula One driver, cannot make mistakes if he's going to beat Lewis Hamilton. He, he just can't. And yesterday, you know, the, the race this weekend proved that because... The the start the start did cost him. You're right. The 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 the, the jump start was it wasn't it? Uh, you know, a penalty is is irrelevant when it comes to the driver ratings because he, he, the error was already made. And um, I I thought it's, it's perhaps you know the, the sensor clearly not triggered and it's very hard to tell whether he has actually gone beyond his grid box. You know, by the time the lights are out. But nevertheless, he stops. He starts again. He gets going, and he's 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 thoroughly punished for his mistake by his position into into turn one, and then you know at the end of the lap. Um, also with Bottas, I thought he should have come back to second. Verstappen, I think, was there for the taking. You know, I was kind of surprised that Mercedes brought him in. They said they were worried because his tyres were graining and that they didn't have a choice. Their words, because it, and it worked so well for them last year in the same race, doing that with Lewis Hamilton. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think Bottas should have got second. You know, again, he blames traffic. And yeah, that's the problem here, as we've, as we've discussed in, in Hungary. But yeah, not a good day for Valtteri Bottas, that. Okay, so that's all the drivers rated. Um... A couple of, of perfect scores there in the in the form of Magnussen and, and Hamilton. But if you were to give driver of the day, who's your driver of the day? Uh, Kevin Magnussen. Uh, you changed your mind. I'm I know, sure I did. You yeah, said. I did. I was gonna, but it was it would be boring to choose Lewis Hamilton because he's he's so consistently incredible. Um, I just, I genuinely just thought that was tremendous from Magnussen. So yeah, we'll go for that. Um, you know, the reason why I wouldn't go for Verstappen is because it's driver of the day, and he made a very key error on that day which was crashing. Yeah. so that's it all the drivers from the hungarian grand prix are rated do you agree do you disagree head on over to autosport.com and have your say and we'll be back after the first of the next triple header at silverstone see you later